currently requested to mute your microphones and you can use the chat uh, to share questions and opinions. Uh, also, it would be nice if you would like yeah. to write your name and your affiliation in the chat so we get to know you better. And uh, this is it for the practicalities. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what is the objective of this webinar? We would like to update the community and give some highlights regarding new pilots that uh, are currently running uh, for elders. And um, in addition to this, we would also like to give you a glimpse about to what the, the future of elders will be and what we are planning for the next phases. Uh, the agenda of this webinar uh, is so first we are going to present um, a current pilot, which is called the CAT AP Feeds. Uh, this will be presented by Matthias Palmer, who is um, who is working for Meta Solutions and the Agency for Digitalization Sweden. Also, Peter Kolpart, uh, member of IMEC, UGENT and CEMIC, will um, will present uh, the CAT AP Feeds together with Matthias. And next, we are going to have a presentation about DCAT AP feeds on data.europa.eu. Uh, here we have Simon Stair for, from the Publication Office of the EU. Uh, our next presentation will be related to a pilot that is currently running on Rex Museum. And the presentation will be given by Tim Thomansen uh, from Max Doro and Rex Museum. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we will conclude uh, looking at the future of LDS and what are the next steps. So, before we start with the very interesting presentations that we have for today, I would like to uh, give a very, very short uh, introduction on LDS in case uh, you are not familiar with it or just to refresh your memory. So, LDS is a publication, is a same specification to start with this. It's a same specification and it is promoted as a publication technology to share and aggregate information with or from multiple parties. So, here what we are trying to promote with LDS is that we are bridging uh, the two different uh, interoperability layers, the semantic and the technical layer, with this uh, new technology. Uh, LDES allows everyone to replicate data and stay up to date uh, regarding the unique source of truth. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Yes. So, what is LDES? Uh, as you may tell from the name, LDES uh, is um, a combination of uh, two methodologies, two technologies, link data and event stream. So, an LDES, a link data event stream, is a collection of immutable objects where uh, when you stream data, you don't have to change the data, but you just um, uh, simply add new data records to the stream. Um, it is, as we said, a publication strategy and is aimed to publish and make data discoverable in a cost-effective and a flexible manner. So, uh, LDS helps in structuring data as stream data and enables users to keep track of what has changed in the data and always being up to date. So, uh, you can have, uh, when using LDS, you can have up to date data. Be aware of the changes because what is streamed and what is uh, published is the changes and the differences between that uh, we notice in data. You can have access to historic data and relate the historic data to current data. So, having said this, we can move to our first presentation which is the introduction to DCAT AP feeds. And here I give the, the floor to Matthias Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. I think we will present together with... No, okay, it's... Did we change the order? Okay, didn't understand that. 
Uh, oh, yeah. then we'll, we'll, we'll first uh, uh, go into the, the, the business uh, reasoning uh, b behind DIG and then we dive into the specification itself. Yeah. Great. <laughs> then uh, uh, Matthias Ekem and I will present together. Uh, uh, Matthias Ekem, maybe you will start with doing the, the agency's perspective and then we'll switch over on slide yes. eight or something. Yes. Uh, thank you for having us uh, on this presentation. Uh, switch to the next slide. Um, as uh, I see in the meeting, we are lots of lots of Matthias's here today, and two of us is uh, sharing this presentation. I work as an information architect at the uh, Agency for Digital Government, big, uh, and uh, just will uh, make a short introduction uh, to uh, Matthias Palmier. Um, and we can take the next slide. This is what we are going to talk about. Uh, very short about the switch data portal and the business case. And then Matthias will come into what is all the fuss about harvesting and implementation report and future issues. And, and the Swedish data portal as um, uh, dataportal.se is the address and um, it has existed in uh, since uh, 2014 and since 2019 it has been um, uh, at the our agency the, the agency for the government and uh, it contains the national registry for data sets as well as support for data users and data producers and we recently, if you switch to the next, uh, we just uh, launched a new interface, uh, which besides the central search function uh, contains uh, more content and good examples to become a digital arena for data producers and data users who want to collaborate and innovate with data. Uh, so, uh, uh, lots of uh, support and good examples and so on on the new uh, data portal that they see uh, and we have three ways of harvesting data catalogs first is the shared editing platform the national instance and then the shared domain catalogs for example uh, geographic uh, data and then uh, individual catalogs and the business case is uh, for exploring uh, LDS. Uh, we have uh, synchronization issues with data.europa.eu. Uh, and we need to minimize discrepancies in dataset search and quicker detection of problems and quicker updates. And uh, the use of standards uh, so it can we can uh, validate that the use of the harvesting protocol is followed and define more clearly what is needed to be harvested and also harvesting uh, scalability so i uh, leave to uh, matthias to continue this okay thank you um right so harvesting this wonderful word what does it mean let's go for the next slide um, so for us, we have uh, more and more look, started to look at harvesting that is going to be in, in two phases, uh, like a primary harvesting phase of data catalogs. That means fi figuring out what data sets, data set series now in the newest version of DCAT 3, DCAT AP3, and also data services since we have some since uh, a couple of years back. Uh, so as uh, Matthias Ekem said, we, we harvest from three different kind of sources, the national one, the uh, domain specific catalogs, and also the, uh, the individual ones, which means that we have a mechanism for registering a data catalog on a, like a registry instance where you go and you say, here is my data catalog, please go and fetch it. And then we find all of these things. But then we can also find that some of the data sets actually contains concepts uh, or good examples or quality reviews or specifications. Um, 
we have some plans for future, as you see, models and quality reviews, like information models is something we don't have in place yet, but, but the other parts are uh, way on, uh, well on their way. So that means we harvest the catalogs and then we look into the catalog and say, here we can understand a few more things about some of these data sets and we enter into a second, uh, secondary phase of harvesting. So next slide. So let's focus on the primary harvesting mechanism at, uh, as, yeah, the way we have it right now. The process is we have agreed on that you have to deliver uh, one file per source, but the source can in principle be in a domain uh, catalog like for geodata, which in itself contains many data catalogs. Uh, even though we don't prefer that, it is supported. Right now we only support RDF uh, XML format uh, that can easily be changed, of course. We do some kind of extraction of entities, data sets, distributions, data set series, data services, etc. cetera, uh, based on uh, like a kind of a closure algorithm based on the URI and the typing. We sometimes need to do URI generation because even though we have specified that well, for instance, contact points cannot be blank nodes, they have to be URIs for for, for persistence to, to make sure that we don't mix them up in the future. That is not always uh, followed, that guidance. So we need to generate your eyes or mint your eyes in some cases. We also do fingerprinting, make sure that we don't update things unnecessarily often. And we validate the special DCAT APSE, the variant we have in Sweden. We produce an harvesting report and we notify uh, the source uh, based on their email they have registered if there are errors or Rather, if there are mandatory fields missing or recommended fields missing. We can also do more, but at this point, that's the level we have reached. The issues we have encountered is that the DCAT AP is really a vocabulary, it's not a protocol. So also that when people do deliver um, RDF XML, it is fragile. People do it in a more syntactical manner sometimes, which means to syntactical errors, which can cause a lot of weird triples appearing in the import step. As I already mentioned, identifiers are missing. Um, it's sometimes implicit when to update. It is hard to detect with a fingerprinting mechanism if something is really changing. For instance, some people or some sources update the modification date. Should that really be considered that a, a real update? Of course, we also have scalability issues when we have these, especially these domain catalogs, which contains a lot of catalogs, a lot of data sets, and we are missing some of the reports from the upstream harvesting, which is something we've been discussing with the data Europe.eu or kindly been asking for for some time. How do we handle that? So next slide. So basically, why do we go, why do we want to change we have solutions, as you've seen already, for quite a lot of the problems, but uh, as some of them remain or are a bit sensitive, we prefer to solve things together and document the mechanism clearly. And that's where, what we want to achieve here, um, more specifically. Next slide. So we have all of these sources. Today, we have most of these files. Um, on, located on addresses that we basically just load and then we import, uh, convert, notify and all of these things. And then we can also do an aggregated file up to the data europe.eu. Now we want to add this LDAS uh, or DCAT AP feeds uh, mechanism. And these are the green ones. We, yeah, let's take next slide. So the, the harvesting then comes in two Parts. You need to export according to LDAS from the source and you need to import into the harvester in the harvester uh, platform. And when it comes to implementation of the system that's out of our control. So in this pilot from Sweden's perspective, we are focusing on uh, the entry store platform, which I'm responsible for, which is uh, quite a lot of the instances in Sweden are using that. So we want to have native support uh, and it's in planning phase we have some ideas of wrappers and this uh, step. We also want them to have an implementation in the data portal uh, and we are ongoing. Uh, we, have, we are doing some experiments right now. It's not in, in, it's not running yet, but it's well on its way. 
And then the export, uh, Peter has already done some um, based on our uh, dumps, uh, done an implementation about that. Uh, spoilers. Yeah, sorry about <laughs> that, <laughs> but you will get into the details. Uh, and we have, I've heard that datareurope.eu has some implementation ongoing as well. I'm very curious about hearing about that. Let's take next slide. Future issues. Yes, next slide. So main headache that we have to overcome in the current setup is that we, for instance, in entry store, we don't have deletes uh, recorded. We can have them. We have had them at some point in time, but we are not having them right now. So how do we overcome that? Uh, do we change that in the protocol? Do we support uh, a way of, yeah, sending over a lot more information every time? Um, or do we do the original system or do we do a wrapper? That's the, maybe there is a solution zero here, changing the protocol as well. But um, I think we will start with the wrapper and then maybe move towards uh, support in the original system. And then we need to agree on how it's, how long should you keep a record of deleted entities? I mean, that Kuni principle grow over time. So, but it's kind of a, not so much information to store. So maybe it's not so sensitive. So, yeah, next slide. Um, right, so when we are doing har harvesting using RDA, uh, uh, yeah, LDAS, do we agree on an information model for a harvesting report? I think it's fundamental to be able to keep tabs on what has happened in the harvesting process. And the information model should be shared across, uh, well, in Europe, I think. Right now, we have something uh, that we have hacked to, locally in Sweden, would be very interesting to agree with, for instance, uh, data.europe.eu, and maybe we could bring that into the specification. Of course, we could do just a JSON expression, something very simple, uh, like an output for a shackle validation, plus some more information. I think, though, that it would be interesting to, to lift ourselves a bit here and think of it from a more of a, what's the use case really we want to support. So how should, detailed should it be? Who is it directed towards? Is it the portal providers or is it more the data catalog providers? And actually, maybe it should be the same. It's a bit about the user friendliness of it. Next step, slide. Right, so as I told you about, we have this first level of harvesting and then we have the second line of harvesting or say second phase of harvesting. And that means we need to be able to harvest other things than it's not data sets like um, standards expressed in SCOS, no, concepts expressed in SCOS, stand, uh, specifications expressed in PROF, and maybe good use cases and so on. So where do we stop? How many different specifications should we have? Could we provide some kind of simplified parameterized specification that is easy to apply to new situations with new vocabularies? Yep, next slide. And we have to keep track of the backwards compatibility. We cannot just go cold turkey for all of the those that have already made all of the efforts. We have to support the file-based harvesting. How do we then do the reports uh, that be, will be the same for the two different harvesting mechanisms? Uh, it will be an increased burden for some time at least. Um, yeah. Next slide. Yeah, that's all. So I guess next presentation, let's go into the feeds. Yes. All right. Um, uh, uh, Emil, shall I share my screen instead? Is that, is, would that be more convenient? Uh, you can take over if you want. Yes. Yes. I want to do that. Yeah. Yes. There we go. So, um, We've been uh, working on the uh, LDAS DCAT AP feeds specification, DCAT AP feeds, DCAT feeds for the uh, for the uh, for the for the friends, uh, I would say. And uh, how did it uh, how did it come into place? Well, um, last year in September uh, and, and August September, uh, um, uh, we did uh, with Semic we did an entire tour of a lot of member states just asking them uh, or interviewing them about uh, LDAS and business potential and so on. 
And we mainly identified the case of harvesting. There are a lot of different uh, uh, harvesting cases, whether we are talking about cultural heritage, for example, where, where you have uh, a lot of museums and galleries and so on that need to uh, that that will be get harvested in Europeana. Whether we are talking about railway infrastructure, for example, where where all the member states need to publish it in the railway infrastructure data set of Europe. Whether we are talking about address databases. Whether we are talking, of course, about uh, um, uh, metadata as well, the DKTP uh, data, we also need to uh, uh, make sure that all the member states' data arrive in data.europa.eu. So um, we've uh, mainly talked on uh, about the, the, uh, this, this uh, uh, business logic, uh, the, the, the one that just uh, was presented, mainly talked about that with, uh, with Sweden, although we knew that, of course, in, in all the other member states, exactly the same problem uh, uh, or, or other member states are dealing with, with exactly the, 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 the same problem. I then first encountered uh, Matthias, which was not pleasant at all, because he said, God damn it, your LDS, that won't ever work because you don't have support for uh, named graphs. We had a big discussion about, about, about potentially supporting named graphs in, in, in LDAS because I was not uh, the, the, the best proponent of named graphs because named graphs are oh, they're, they're quite unspecified. However, the easy, the easy fix, of course, is to make sure that in LDAS or maybe in the in, in tree, the, the underlying hypermedia specification, that we would actually get uh, 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 some kind of specified semantics of the uh, of the named graph. And that was actually standardized in in, in, the, in that course as well. And in October, we actually had uh, named graphs in uh, linked data event streams as well. Um, and uh, that uh, that made sure that Sweden, Dick, and Matthias uh, also wanted to go forward. November, we got a go. So uh, uh, in, in November, and we already cheated a little bit because we already started work up in, in, in October and so on. Uh, but in December, we had the first physical meeting uh, uh, of, uh, of of Sweden and and and, uh, and Ghent University there, uh, uh, where we um, had a couple of beers and uh, made sure that we had a first draft uh, uh, by the end of of December of the spec. In January, February, uh, uh, we made sure that we had a first implementation based on the Swedish uh, uh, dumps, as uh, Matthias already said. Um, then in March, we put in. A lot of work to make sure to finalize the specification, to 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 make sure to discuss uh, a couple of issues with with uh, with, uh, with the various people, to make sure that we have an implementation that works uh, of the of the harvester and so on. We'll we'll, we'll show that later. But uh, today we are uh, happy to show this uh, uh, official draft uh, in um, uh, in in this uh, webinar. In June, that's the next step. Uh, that's that's for the future. We are going to have um, a workshop during SEMIC 2024. 20, uh, um, where we will launch the official uh, first spec uh, and we will show the first uh, uh, real implementation uh, of that. Um, you can still join that uh, workshop online. Uh, just go to the website of the SEMIC 2024 uh, website and register uh, for online attendance. And I'm happy uh, uh, to know being able to show you the first DCAT AP feeds uh, specification. I think someone will be able to paste that link in the uh, in, in the chat for you to click it. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, let's uh, go into it, what, what exactly it is. Because in fact, we already have the linked data event streams uh, specification, but the linked data event stream specification is domain agnostic. It doesn't work for one specific uh, uh, domain. And if you want to implement it for a specific domain, a lot of different questions are still going to be uh, going to pop up. So we kind of need some um, primer documents maybe for each domain of how you would apply linked data event streams in that domain. And this is exactly what DKTP feeds uh, is for uh, applying LDAS in, uh, uh, for the uh, DCAT domain. What does the specification itself uh, still uh, say? Well, uh, we will uh, apply uh, some, some, some base semantics for the base events. Uh, the base events will be create, update, or delete. Then we'll, uh, we'll define how these events need to be structured, like what's part of one atomic event, what, what needs to be uh, part of that. Then we'll dive into how to describe the linked data event stream from the perspective of the DKTP feed. Uh, we'll also define a retention policy on, on that because we don't want to keep all data indefinitely uh, uh, on our system and most systems just keep the latest version by default. 
Um, then we'll talk about pagination and we'll talk about shackle shapes as well, uh, which of course there are official DKTP uh, uh, shackle shapes, but these can be slightly extended to also include the create update deletes and how to, to, to put the standalone entities in there and so on. We'll, uh, we'll get to that. Um, we were unsure about about the, the 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 audience whether the audience preferred JSONLD or a turtle or trick uh, uh, maybe. Um, so instead of doing a poll, we just decided to to always include both examples. Look at what you uh, what you like to look at uh, uh, best. If you're a JSON developer, you probably will like this better. If you're a turtle developer, you'll probably like this uh, better. Um, there's someone who is uh, unmuted. Uh, Case, can you can you mute? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so we'll uh, uh, we'll continue with uh, uh, with this. A DKTP feed basically is just an append only log of uh, of of, uh, of events, and we'll reuse the activity streams vocabulary. Activity streams uh, has been used a lot uh, in the past in in, in for uh, activity pub, for example. Uh, activity purpose is what uh, what uh, uh, boosts um, social media like uh, functionality. So it's used behind uh, Mastodon as well, for example, uh, the Fediverse as as we call it. Um, but also here it makes a lot of sense because activity streams they have uh, words for to 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 say hey you have a create and you have an, an update and you may also delete something and it's just these three types that will actually support in Dcat AP uh, feeds. A create will have uh, a creator or an update are both uh, processed as upserts. So you'll just um, uh, overwrite uh, whatever that has already been there uh, based on that uh, object that you that you have uh, over here. So uh, data set one, that's the identifier of the entity that we are creating at this moment. And we are creating that at a certain or we published this create at a certain uh, uh, date time. Good. What triples do we do we absurd or remove? Well, that's what we'll use uh, uh, named graphs for. So uh, otherwise, if, if you just process a create, you'll otherwise have to somehow know yourself whether you need to dereference that object or whether you uh, need to get it from, from, from somewhere else. Well, over here in DKTP feeds, we say, well, we'll just uh, make sure that we uh, include it in this name graph. Uh, so if, if uh, there's an event one of that data set that is the create, we'll use that same URI of, uh, of data set one event one as the named graph, and then we'll include all the triples that need to be upserted in that uh, name graph. That way we're certain, we're uh, exactly certain what kind of triples are part of that uh, uh, update. And then, of course, we still in our page that we that we publish in our DKTP feeds that we publish over HTTP. If we just have one page, one very big page, for example, then we just do it as follows. We call it we call the base of that thing a feed, uh, which is an, an event stream, of course. And then we'll include members, uh, uh, which which is from the tree vocabulary over here. Um, uh, we'll include these uh, members as follows, and then we, uh, uh, we we also make sure that we know where to start from or what the events precisely uh, are. What is part of uh, one update, uh, Matthias? Yeah, so this is a crucial question. Um, so we have a feed of events, and that means that we have to have an idea of a set, what, where does one update start or a creation up, uh, start and where does it end? For instance, can you update a, a data set independently from one of its distributions? Well, we have a little bit of a different uh, opinion here in different uh, camps, but when it comes to contact points, I would prefer to consider them to be separate. So what is separate, that is what we call standalone. And, and a standalone in this case could be a distribution or a data set or a contact point. So that's the standalone entities that you send along as this is an update, this is a name graph of triples. And then it might be that there are things that could be considered as entities that are embedded. And sometimes a distribution can actually be considered as an embedded uh, entity. But for other parts, like if you have a, um, a spatial or a temporal expression that is certainly a blank node with a small thing that is an embedded but we'll see that in the next uh, slide also referenced entities are references to things like um, concepts that are certainly not maintained and, and are not part of the entity uh, event stream so yeah take the next slide i think that explains a lot oh 
next slide disappeared. Sorry, I was gone for a moment, uh, but uh, I think I shared my screen yes. again. Yes, we see it now. So yeah, so here we see uh, three examples, or actually one example with all three characters in one view. So we see a data set, D1. Uh, we have some triples around that data set, and that are part of the standalone named graph entity that is being updated. Uh, also, there's a temporal expression of a start and end date that is an entity in itself. And uh, that's how RDF is structured. You, you, you point to nodes that have further triples. And sometimes these nodes correspond to entities that feel like more or less independent of each other. In this case, it's more of an embedded or an independent entity. And yeah, we call it embedded and it's going to be part of the same name graph uh, update. And then we have something like a theme which is just a reference to a URI that is maintained separately. We don't provide any more triples about this referenced entity. It's just there as one, a single triple. Yeah, next slide. So going through the DCAT AP uh, two and three and, and looking for entities, which entities do we have? Clearly we have a few standalone ones. The catalog in itself is a standalone one, the data set distribution, data service, agent, kind license document, and also I forgot to add a data set ser um, series, which is being added now in DCAT 3. And then we have all of these embedded entities, which are things that have further triples, the checksum, location, geometry, relationship, activity, and so on, you see them here. And then we have all of these things that are stable URIs that we just refer to. Um, you could, it's a bit hard to identify the reference things exactly with just their types. Sometimes you have to refer to them from which property that are actually pointing to them, uh, like concepts. We have so many different uses of concepts. So in this case, uh, we don't have specific types for all of the different concepts. Instead, we have to identify them which uh, via frequency like acrial periodicity property or uh, DCAT theme, etc. I think that's enough for this. And then, yeah, back to you, Peter. Yeah, thank you very much. Because uh, then something uh, something else we'll do is to configure the, the LDAS itself so that an LDAS client can understand how the feed itself is updating so that it can know that without uh, being an expert in the DCAT AP uh, domain, but that it can just derive it from, from the feed. So one thing we'll do is to add a timestamp path. This uh, timestamp path will be uh, will be just pointing at the property that is being used in order to um, uh, that, is, that is being used in order to um, uh, uh, to, to give a timestamp to, to an update so that you know that one uh, uh, one event is after the other, of course. Uh, so it must be uh, chronologically ordered in order to process it so that you know what uh, what the latest one is. Also, the version of path. This is a uh, this is of course towards versioning. If you want to upsert certain things, you need to know what the identifier will be of uh, what you're uh, upserting. So, so that's the uh, that's the object path that that we know now. So now, and, and can, yes? can I just say one thing here? This is one of the things that I had a bit of a trouble with when I looked at this first time. This is a consequence of the generality of the LDAS specification that you have to say this. Yes, you could have that hard coded into the LDAS, but it is not hard coded. So it's more flexible. Um, and therefore, in for many cases, this is just going to be the same thing in, L, in uh, the DCAT AP feeds. It's going to be the same always. Yeah. Timestamp yeah. so, path, version of path. Yeah. And this is what we what we then uh, really said in the DCAT AP feeds that, uh, that it must be uh, provided so that an LDAS client can uh, even when it doesn't know the DCAT AP feed specification, that it just can interpret the, the, the LDAS. And in uh, uh, in other domains, you might actually use something something else. There are already uh, LDAS uh, 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 linked data event streams around that, for example, use uh, uh, DC terms as version of uh, instead for the for the version of path. So so that's uh, uh, that that we have that over there. Or maybe the timestamp path is a uh, uh, prof generated at uh, uh, these kind of properties, or maybe uh, DC terms created. DC terms modified, uh, these kind of properties. Uh, uh, that's why they need to be configurable because, I mean, there's no standard for everything across the entire world to tell how entities will will uh, update and how they will say that they're an update of certain uh, 
of, of something. So that's why it needs to be uh, configured uh, indeed. Then um, LDAS by default uh, is an append only log, which means that only things will get added. That means that for the history that if certain things disappear, that they're not really disappeared from the from the LDAS itself, but that they just disappeared from disk on your uh, on on your server. So conceptually, they're still part of the LDAS, but they're just not published anymore in your view. So this is a a, a distinction that we have in LDAS. On one hand, we can point at the data set, uh, uh, meaning the, the the event stream itself, and on the other hand, we can say, hey, but this is a view that publishes that LDAS in a certain way, and that view can decide to have retention policies to say like, oh, no, we only have the latest version. Uh, we only keep that uh, uh, on, on this. So by default, what you'll do is have a full history. So so all the updates, even if uh, even if the certain data sets are like updated three times a day, you'll have three, these, uh, three of these updates uh, uh, in there. However, if you want to have the latest uh, version subset, then for yesterday, if that, that data set updated three times, well, maybe you only want to keep that latest uh, uh, version because uh, in a latest version subset, it's not important to understand how uh, uh, how it got there or what the intermediary uh, uh, updates uh, updates were. So that latest version subset for um, uh, DCAT catalogs is actually also the recommended uh, one because we also want to make sure that it's uh, uh, that that you're not uh, that you won't have until the end of time always uh, have to keep all the. Uh, updates about uh, 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 all the uh, intermediary updates because that's going to blow up uh, probably the, the the size of your uh, uh, of your publishing. Um, how do you do that? Well, you simply add in your view. So you say, hey, the view. This is the current page. Uh, so a relative URI is is, is being used here. Um, and then in that uh, view, you specify, hey, there's a retention policy, it's a late latest version subset, and there's only uh, one, uh, uh, one latest version that I keep of this uh, thing. Now, there's a, there's a small problem because we always talked about, ah, but uh, we'll just put the entire catalog in, in, in one uh, page. So now we can look at pagination, like how do we, uh, how do we fragment uh, the, the uh, data set so that we can achieve our goals uh, more efficiently? And that actually triggers what is the goal behind our feed. And the goal, of course, is replication and synchronization. We want to make sure that copying the full uh, uh, copying, uh, uh, copying until the state until now that that goes uh, efficiently, but also that then afterwards synchronization itself also runs efficiently while also keeping a pretty lightweight uh, 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 thing at the, at the server side. Because on the server side, we chose a data dump to begin with for for a reason. It's really easy to to, to generate. It's quite uh, it's quite uh, uh, when it's generated, it's it's there and people can 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 sync uh, can can copy it. So that's so that's useful. So we just need to find a way to have this data dump to 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 also make it efficient for uh, updates. Because if for every update we have to download that full data dump again, that's going to be uh, problematic. The solution that we that we came up with with is a search tree. So um, so this is also commonly used if, for example, you want to uh, copy entire OpenStreetMap uh, to, to, to your own system. For example, you'll also have ah uh, these uh, the, these uh, uh, year, month, uh, uh, day, hour uh, to even minutes uh, uh, minutely uh, uh, differentials that 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 you can get. Well, in this search tree, we're just going to, uh, to to put all these create updates and, and deletes. We're just going to uh, uh, make sure that they're uh, paged inside uh, their uh, their year or month or day or even our uh, page. Um, this is lightweight because it can be statically generated just as you would do for a data dump. But equally as well, you can just have it as a dynamic application on top of your uh, uh, database. So that's uh, uh, that's what we saw as uh, an, an interesting thing. Search trees are quite new in the uh, in the uh, linked data world in the hypermedia uh, uh, world, uh, basically when building APIs. Um, and the tree specification is actually the first one that actually does that. So the W3C3 community group, this is where that standardization of these relations uh, happen. Uh, we, quite, we rely quite often in linked data event streams on uh, the three hypermedia specification. 
and this basically is how you would uh, describe that uh, uh, that 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 relation. Um, so uh, uh, so over here we say there's a three relation greater than or equal to relation. Uh, it works on that path published, so it's a timestamp path that's that's being used over here. Um, and uh, uh, everything that we'll find over here will be greater than or equal to uh, 2020 0101. Uh, so it's, of course, the page of the year uh, 2020 uh, over here. So that's how we describe it. Uh, over here in the turtle example, I also gave the less than uh, uh, link over here so that we actually have a bounded description of the year. Uh, it's, of course, less than uh, 2021 uh, over here. So that's how we describe uh, uh, search trees. So basically, in the in the, in the first root uh, element, um, uh, uh, you you start with the year, then the months, and then you uh, uh, finally get to the leaf nodes where you actually have uh, the data itself. And uh, finally, in the uh, for the specification, uh, we have the uh, we we also published uh, shackless shapes. We this, we uh, base them uh, upon the 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 DCAT uh, AP shapes, the, the official ones uh, that are that are being published uh, and created by Bert van Uffel, um, and the the, the DCAT AP team, of course. Um, but then we extend it by saying, ah, but there's an activity here that gets published, and uh, it can be either an upsert or a delete, and uh, these, uh, uh, and then over there you'll get a standalone entity uh, over there that can be only one of the standalone uh, entities. What we learned basically is that name graphs are a very elegant uh, way, in addition to the to the LDAS pack. Um, we got more input for the LDS pack itself, like uh, Matthias uh, uh, also already said, we might also want to have specific retention policies for, for deletions, for example. Uh, and we might be interested in building domain-specific uh, uh, primers, not to be very normative, like also Sander said in the chat, uh, he, he said, uh, uh, but uh, 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 we must make sure that create a data lead, that we don't have to specify that in, in all of these primers specifically, but that we just have it as a node in the LDAS specification. I agree that that hopefully, if if something like that case is is uh, uh, is is, uh, uh, is being done, that we of course across the entire LS ecosystem always choose for this for a similar way of doing of uh, processing these create update elites and maybe other uh, types than than them as well. Um, we might actually also write this domain specific primer uh, for uh, the cultural heritage, uh, but uh, most importantly. Today is that DKTP feeds specification is now ready for your comments and implementations. So happy publishing. Good. Emil, back to you. Yes. Here we go. Um, so next up will be uh, Simon Stur. I'm not going to try it, uh, from uh, data.europa.eu, uh, showing their perspective on the matter. Hello Simon. and welcome. Hello and welcome. Um, I would like to show you a bit what Data Europa is doing in terms of harvesting and how we plan to implement uh, LDS. Um, and um, next slide, please. So um, Data Europa is like a federated catalog where we harvest um, European countries, 35 European countries, and over 183 catalogs, which means um, we are very dependent on uh, the metadata we get and that we can harvest them properly and that the services are reliable and everything is working. And that's why I wanted to show you how we are doing it currently and the many steps which are included in it. Next slide. So on the left, for example, you can see how uh, DataGov UK uh, dataset looks like and how it will look then in Data Europa. So basically, we're harvesting their endpoint um, and then we, we show it on our portal. But there are, of course, many steps in between. Uh, next. So there, there are, in general, we have two ways of getting data sets to our portal. One is by harvesting. For example, we also harvest uh, the Swedish open data portal. And the other one is when data providers push their data to us. So we have an interface, which is like basically a web form where you can type it in. And they can also send us their packages via an API. Next slide. 
So how do we go about for uh, a data catalog, for example? So we have a first process, which is the data acquisition. And there we schedule um, when the pipeline is going to start. Um, most of the time we have a weekly um, scheduler, which means once a week we harvest uh, um, uh, a catalog, sometimes uh, more, more often if there are more changes. And then we import the data set, uh, the metadata. So we, we send a request to, to the portal. And um, in the best case, we harvest the DCAD AP, then the process is pretty simple. But um, many, many data catalogs don't use DCAD AP yet. So then there needs to be a transformer. So then we transform the metadata we get into DCAD AP. We have a lot of rules which are written in JavaScript to um, modify certain catalogs and they and each of those rules need to be one by one. Um, so it's very high in maintenance, even though we have certain packages for um, different catalogs like Sikan catalogs, it's still uh, a lot of work. Um, this transforming part is also the part where most of the things could go wrong depending on how things are encoded. Next slide. So then we process and store the metadata, which means um, we store it in our triple store, which is a virtuoso triple store. And um, we offer, we modify them to RDF. On the portal, you can also download the metadata in Turtle, JSON, LD, and triples, and so on. Um, we generate unique IDs and uh, we provide some interlinking, especially if with uh, certain ontologies and uh, and vocabularies. Then we have to index them, otherwise you cannot find them. So here we use Elasticsearch and we have to flatten the DCAD uh, RDF because it's very big into a simpler JSON file. And then we um, look for the most important words for from the properties like title and description because that's most of the time what people are looking for. Then we send the whole package um, to eTranslation, which is a service from the Commission, where we offer then translations in all EU languages, which is quite handy because if you're looking for a German data set, you can also search for it in English and in other, in other languages, and also the, the description, the title, the distributions, they're all translated. So it's much easier to find the data sets in your language. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Then the, the next step is very important. We check for the quality. So we apply um, W3C shuttle shapes. Um, we check if there are certain violations and most of the time there are quite a lot for certain catalogs. We um, apply certain rules um, and we check for accessibility. In uh, We do tests for each distribution, like the actual data. So we check if the link is working and so on. Then we annotate the data set, which means um, we check all the DCAD AP fields. We, this is basically the FAIR principles or inspired by FAIR principles where we check is everything there, which is it complete. We evaluate the format, the types, availability, licensing information, and so on. And then we can really give a, a metadata scoring which is only for the metadata, not for the data. And in the last step, we have a reporter um, where we apply the data vocabulary, data quality vocabulary, where we create quality reports where we can send, which you can send to data providers and tell them, okay, um, you're missing this metadata property or there's something wrong here, please look at it. Um, and then of course, there's also a human readable version which you can access via the internet. Next slide. Uh, pretty uh, difficult is identifier handling. The reason is because um, every member state has their own identifier in a way, and um, it makes sense, of course, on their level to have a similar structure. So we store the original identifier, um, but we also add an identifier on our level. Um, so then basically have two identifiers, um, but like this, we can really say, okay, this is the right data set. 
Um, next slide. And here you see, for example, how such a data set would look like with the meta information and the different segments. Um, yeah, next slide. And here on, on the screenshot, you see our harvester in, in GitLab. And you see the different formats uh, like CCAN, JSON API, RDF, Socata, and so on. And for all of them, we have different importing rules and uh, different harvesting processes. So um, this is quite cumbersome to support all of them. And we are always advocating to use all the standards, all the vocabularies which are available, all the tools which are open source, so that um, we avoid this madness of different formats. And how is our software? Um, we have a Java framework. Um, we use a lot of microservices. Our deployment is via Docker and Kubernetes. So it's very flexible and uh, scalable quite nicely. As I said, we have a Virtuoso triple store and we search via Elasticsearch. And our front page, or which is basically an application, is via Vue.js. And um, there it loads the data sets, the catalogs, and so on. Next slide. And here you see a bit the features we put on top of DataRopper. On the left, you see um, the metadata quality scoring. So this helps um, data providers, okay, which field, which properties are missing, where did I do something wrong? And also the distribution quality, in case uh, something is not working well, you can embed your data set, um, which is handy for data providers who don't really have a, their own website, so, or where, where you just want to show certain data set under publication. You can cite a data set, which we saw now is very important also in the research domain, because a lot of people are using data for their PhDs, for their bachelor master thesis, and uh, it's very important that they cite the data set properly. So you can export the data set, citation in Harvard, APA, and so on. If you are um, on a data set, you can also search for similar data sets in case this data set it's not what you're looking for, but there, there might be others which are better. And you can also see um, how well certain catalogs are aligned with DKDP. Next slide. So you, you saw this is quite a long step and there can be a lot of um, issues on the way. And we, we also face a lot of issues currently or all the time when data providers change their um, their models, when they change their website, when they change their portal, when they use new software, when they update certain things. So whenever this is, uh, there might be a problem. And that's why we are quite keen on doing data event streams. Next slide. Because um, even though it adds one more step, so in total it's a step more, which looks better, uh, worse, but um, like this, we can really reduce the harvesting to new, updated, and deleted data sets only. And now our approach is basically if a certain catalog has 100,000 data sets, every week we harvest 100,000 data sets from zero, and the week after, again, 100,000. And uh, then we have to go through the whole process again, translate, index, and so on. So it takes quite a lot of compute, so it's also expensive and uh, a lot of errors can be in between. And if we reduce it to new, updated, and deleted, uh, I think uh, it can go down to only 5%. So for us, it would be like a 20x uh, improvement also in terms of uh, 20 times less compute power needed. We also hope to offer more details about the history of data sets. So when was it updated, which is the new version, and so on. Because sometimes this could be interesting also if you're doing a research project and you're based your research on a certain data set in time, and then the data set gets updated, um, then there might be a problem. And we're currently doing some tests um, on our portal together with the help of Bidget, and I think they are quite promising. And uh, from now on, uh, I think there will be many more advantages, And uh, but we also see that this might be a very long-term project until until it's applied in all the member states and all the catalogs. 
Next slide. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, our next speaker is uh, from the Rijksmuseum and it's Tim Thomassen. Um, so I'll give him the floor. Services team, which is responsible for uh, developing our integration layer. Um, and with it, we connect our source systems and make data from the Rex Museum accessible for users within the Rex Museum uh, as well as externally. Um, and together with the University of Ghent, we are doing a semi pilot to implement linked data event streams as one of the protocols uh, to track changes. Uh, next slide, please. So the entire collection of the Rijksmuseum contains about 1 million objects, 450,000 books, 800 meters of documentation and 17 terabytes of uh, data. And when you go visit the museum, you'll be, about, uh, you'll be able to see about 6,000 objects. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information that the visitors can't actually see. Um, so we're looking at digital solutions uh, uh, to make all this information accessible. Uh, currently, all this info is in multiple systems. We have uh, COA, our library system. We have Adlib as a collection management system and join uh, for the archive as document management system. Um, and each system has its own way of storing information, as you know. Uh, it has its own data format and its own API. Uh, and we want to make it easier for uh, internal systems and internal users, as well as external users to, uh, to get the information they need from those systems uh, in a consistent format. Uh, and that's where uh, the integration layer comes in. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a team of six people working on the integration layer. Uh, we work using the Agile methodology, and so we have a fast uh, development cycles, and we can regularly release about once per week or once per two weeks. Uh, and our main focus of work is uh, data, en data engineering for translating the data from our source to our domain, uh, to our access models. Uh, we create the microservices and we uh, create the infrastructure for running those microservices in the cloud, including the databases, web services, and anything else uh, that's required. Uh, and we run it all in uh, Azure. Um, so let's take a look at what our integration layer is on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we've, we've defined it as infrastructure that connects systems and makes data accessible. Uh, and uh, it has four responsibilities, integration, standardization, validation, and synchronization. Um, so integration, I've already uh, touched this, we want to connect the data from the different systems. Uh, so when I'm looking at the book in our library system that's about the Night Watch, uh, it should somehow be linked to uh, the painting that's on display. Um, we have standardization. So. Um, all the source systems contain and store the data in their own format. Uh, we want the users to have a consistent uh, and predictable uh, data service. Uh, and to do that, we uh, have to standardize the data. Um, we validate uh, our data and we do that when uh, we integrate our source systems, but also when we integrate our users. Um, so we make sure the data is of the, the highest quality that, uh, that we can get. Um, and lastly, because all that data, it, it still changes, uh, so we have to keep it up to date. Our integration layer has to be able to process changes in data in our source systems and make them available uh, to our users. This is also where LDAS uh, comes in. Um, and those users can be within the Active as well, external, as I've said before. Um, when talking about internal users, we're uh, looking at, for example, getting information from our library system, COA, into our uh, collection management system, Adlib. Uh, and an example of an external user is uh, the company that manages our website, Rijksmuseum.nl, uh, and that company uh, needs the data as well, um, just like any other third-party uh, websites or systems that want to work with our data. Um, so I've highlighted standardization because I'd like to go into that a little bit more on the next slide. 
So in our current situation, we have uh, system specific data structures and communication protocols. Um, so if we look at the example of our website, Rijksmuseum.nl, uh, which is managed by that external company, um, they don't only manage the, the front end uh, uh, of the website, but they also manage the infrastructure that's required to transform the data um, into a format that they can work with, uh, with the site. Um, so they get the data straight from our collection management system and have to transform that source data into a format they can work with. They also manage the data services uh, that external parties uh, again use uh, to get our data. Um, next slide, please. Some of those parties uh, are here. We have Modemuse. They display a collection on their website. You can see it on the image on the right, uh, and they get it using OIPMH. Uh, just like Europeana, um, we have the Koninklijke Vereniging van Vrienden der Asiatische Kunst, and they also get our data uh, using JSON. Um, so while these protocols work to exchange the data, um, in our current situation, uh, they are, like I said, managed by Q42. Um, they've created functionality for us to manage those data services, but we'd rather manage those ourselves. And we want to make the shift from uh, the shift to link data to be able to provide richer data as well. Um, and that's why we started created the, creating the integration layer. And uh, it also led to the uh, collaboration uh, with the University of Ghent uh, and the Dutch Consortium against the capacity to implement linked data event streams. Uh, next slide, please. So the goal of the Against Opacity Data Hub is to bring together and rich and provide insights into information on collections from uh, colonial contexts. They're an example of an external aggregator that wants to communicate with us using LDES. And it's a perfect use case for us to start implementing it. Um, and with the introduction of the integration layer, we can shift the responsibility from transforming the data and providing the data services from our website uh, company uh, back to uh, Rexmuseum itself, uh, so we don't depend on external parties anymore. Next slide, please. So we start doing this by following the standards. So um, not only our website portal, but also uh, others such as Against Opacity can use uh, our data. Uh, for communication, we use protocols such as LDES, OEI, PMH, and REA. Um, we can standardize the data itself by, uh, by using linked art. Um, when we take the responsibility for transforming the data, uh, we also take responsibility for the infrastructure that's required uh, to do those transformations. Um, so we connect our integration layer to our source systems, transform the data, and provide the data services that supply uh, the data in those standardized formats to our website builders, but now also uh, to the other aggregators. Um, so I'll uh, show a little bit of how we uh, we set this up technically on the next slide. Uh, we're using infrastructure as code. Uh, so we have definitions for our microservices, databases, network proxies, uh, uh, like all the infrastructure required uh, to run our integration layer. Um, and this is many advantages. We can uh, we can create as many environments as we like. Uh, we can redeploy infrastructure uh, when there's been an update on our code base, uh, but also uh, in case of disaster recovery, it's really easy to, to set up uh, the whole integration layer again. And it also makes it really uh, scalable. Um, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, no, <laughs> not yet. Um, so, um, so we run uh, all this infrastructure on our uh, Azure cloud. Uh, so we don't have to worry about physical servers or update management. Uh, it offers a lot of flexibility. We can scale as far as we like. Um, and uh, uh, they allow us to run all types of uh, resources. Uh, even if we just, just want to test something out, it's really easy to do it. Um, and then we have continuous deployment. We can deploy changes easily and automatically. So uh, when we have a code change or a, a transformation change, um, we have an automated deployment uh, that deploys to our test environment and we can let have uh, automated tests run there uh, before we uh, go to our next environments and eventually to production. Um, and all this infrastructure is, is purely to run our, uh, our microservice architecture. Um, next slide. And 
Um, so we've, we've structured our integration layer using this architecture, and that means that we have uh, the, the not one big monolithic application, we've got it split up. Um, it's a lot easier to maintain, it's uh, easier to deploy because we can we can just deploy the, the, the single microservice that has the change instead of uh, redeploying the whole application. Um, and it's, it's easier to scale. Um, we've noticed that uh, in some examples, getting data from source systems was really performant, but uh, certain transformations uh, were slower. We could simply uh, scale our transformation workers up uh, so they could uh, bear the load uh, much easier. Um, we're running the microservices in Docker containers, um, and uh, in those Docker containers, all the external dependencies that are required are defined. Um, so it runs exactly the same on our uh, laptops as it runs uh, in the cloud or in any, any system, really. Um, uh, we have the Kubernetes cluster running in Azure, uh, also on our local uh, machines, uh, basically as the conductor of our Docker containers. Um, it, it can establish relations between parts. So when we uh, deploy a, um, a service, a Docker container that requires a database, database because it insert triples, uh, it can make sure that that database is actually created before. Uh, so it's there and we don't have any errors uh, in that case. Uh, and when errors do happen, uh, it offers reliability. It automatically restarts Docker containers when, uh, when errors happen. Uh, so the whole integration can keep running, um, and again, uh, it uh, it makes the software uh, a lot more scalable. Um, so th this is basically all the architecture that we have um, for uh, for our microservices and for running the LDIS API. Uh, if we go to the uh, uh, to the next slide, I can show a little bit of how we've set that up. We have our uh, Resolver database, uh, Resolver data service that contains uh, one generic web server and uh, the database containing all the, the changes. Um, and uh, it can host multiple APIs looking at those uh, at, at that database. Um, so the, the upside of this is that we have one common setup for all APIs. They require that web server and they require that uh, database. So we don't have to do that uh, multiple times. Um, and for each API we want to expose, we can just create a different, uh, a separate configuration for the endpoint path, uh, and of course the code that's required for containing uh, API-specific queries and uh, definitions. And uh, uh, the University of Ghent did a great job uh, creating that LDIS uh, API together with us. Um, next slide, please. So this uh, concludes my presentation about our implementation. Um, we currently have this API running on our uh, environments and uh, we've worked closely with the University of Ghent, with Peter, uh, to get that LDS client, uh, to, to get their LDS client to consume our API. Um, and we're working to get this implementation to production by November. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Peter will have uh, a small demo of this and his uh, client as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Because now probably uh, some people in the audience will, will, will be thinking like, ah, but why did they, they, they're talking about launching DKTP feeds and now all of a sudden they're inviting Rake's Museum to talk about cultural heritage. Like, like that, that's unrelated. Yes, it is. And that's exactly the, 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 the point uh, of, of, of something that we wanted to, uh, to, to, to show. Because in that, in that timeline, all of a sudden, there was some enthusiasm by Rex Museum. They also published a, a, a blog post at, at some point uh, uh, in which they said, we are going to choose uh, IIIF change discovery. Uh, and oh, yeah, we also looked at LDAS, but it was not entirely clear about how to, how to implement it yet for, for cultural heritage. So we'll take that domain specific uh, uh, specification, IIIF change discovery, which can be used to 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 to, to for for similar uh, uh, use cases, um, and uh, uh, we'll will implement that. So so really the the, the first implementation there was IIIF change discovery, and then based on that blog post, I reached out and I said we really need to work together because look with my team and a couple of uh, uh, it, it may be a, a couple of of um, uh, commits uh, on on your on your Git system. I can I can probably create something that's more performant. That's something that that has uh, a much clearer uh, uh, interface of what exactly changed into your system and look at this DKTP feeds uh, thing that we're 
building, it could be very similar to, 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 to cultural heritage. And on top of that, you will not have to build your own client anymore because you can just use the generic client that can be used both for DCAT AP feeds, but it can also be used for cultural heritage in uh, uh, your domain. So um, I'm going to uh, share my screen again. Screen. Uh, the amount of buttons you need to click before sharing your screen. Yes. All right. And there we go. Um, is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, the, the the demonstrators is uh, what what we uh, uh, what we did uh, is that uh, as Semek we 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 helped both uh, Sweden and uh, Rijks Museum to 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 enable. Uh, uh, to, to, to have a feed. Then we will show quickly show the, the LS client, which is, yeah, of course, difficult to show because it's just data being, being downloaded, basically. Uh, but then we also dive into uh, consumption uh, pipelines uh, over there. Um, we have several publication uh, pipelines. The first one is the Sweden DKTP feeds uh, prototype. So what we did was uh, we have a dump. Uh, so basically a dump is uh, you start uh, downloading this, uh, this page and then you'll download 72 megabytes of RDF data and RDF uh, uh, XML uh, over there. I, I think I remember it was RDF XML, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, what we then did was say, ah, look, okay, so probably the, this is going to get uh, some changes. So what we'll do is we'll create a script called uh, dumps to feed. And dumps to feed is a script that we now actually uh, uh, put on GitHub Actions. And on GitHub Actions, what it simply uh, will do is execute a, uh, a, a thing that will do change detection. So it will extract the standalone entities from the, from the dumps, and then it will check, hey, did it change uh, uh, compared uh, uh, to last time? So that's uh, uh, the script. I put it uh, uh, or let it run in this uh, repository. And in this uh, repository, we now have a folder uh, Sweden that just contains for every day that it has been running so far and has been running since uh, the, the, the 11th of uh, February. We now have um, um, uh, uh, we now have uh, that that overview. So uh, if you go to simply the the, the feed dot ttl over here, uh, so that's basically at uh, on my own domain over here. Then you basically now have that. Uh, uh, what what we promised, right? The uh, relations that you'll see, uh, the relation to that specific day of the 11th of February, the 12th, the 13th, 14th, and so on. So the eldest client will see this page and will know uh, uh, what parts to uh, to to download, uh, uh, basically. So um, we just used GitHub Pages over here to uh, to have a pipeline to publish an LDAS, which is also nice because I said earlier, hey, LDAS, it could be a dynamic application, but it could also just be a static site. And what better uh, to show than a free uh, hosting of uh, GitHub to uh, host this specific uh, linked data event stream over here. The second thing we did was, uh, so we did the materialized or the, 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 the static page uh, 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 implementation over here. For Rake's Museum, what we did was uh, we created a, uh, a specific uh, LDAS uh, view. Um, this is behind uh, authentication though, so you won't be able uh, to see it, but, but basically on top of the internal SQL store, uh, we made uh, sure that there's an internal Python script that is that is running in, in its own uh, container and that exposes uh, the, 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 the view. Um, we did a pull request for that. I, I told them based on that blog post, ah, we can do it in, 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 uh, in, in a couple of commits. In the end, it became 50 commits because also as well, we were not really able to 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 under uh, to 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 test it uh, ourselves on our system, so we each time had to do something, and then they had to test it there, and uh, and and that's how we went uh, uh, back and forth. So this is uh, uh, thanks to to to, to Semek that we were uh, able to do this pilot uh, uh, with, uh, with 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 Rake's Museum uh, uh, to 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 bring that uh, in in production. So. Now it's uh, uh, ah wait I'll I'll actually maybe show um, show that uh, you can now go to the uh, to this page uh, over here they use JSONLD uh, uh, instead 
And over here, what you'll find is just uh, uh, one link to, to another page, and it's the page of 2024. So this is the first uh, year that you'll find. If you click it, you'll uh, you'll enter, and you'll see all the um, uh, all the uh, um, months that are available. And we only put it available this month, so it's only April over here. And then we'll find all the dates for which we have data. And then you'll see that uh, it started the 18th of, of April and it goes uh, on like uh, like this. So and uh, over here, you actually have the uh, actual data uh, behind it. Good. So um, uh, so now simply going to the, to the uh, demo itself. Now you can, uh, if you have Node.js installed, um, you just uh, uh, open up a console and you do npx this is just if you don't have it installed yet it will uh, install it from npm that's what np execute uh, uh, does uh, you just do ldesk client and you add the url of what you want to replicate and then uh, uh, if everything goes right it just starts uh, uh, spitting out uh, the members it doesn't show the members over here because that's quite a lot but just says hey there's uh, progress in uh, downloading uh, these uh, uh, these members over here okay uh, stopping it over here because if you add a dash v to this you'll actually uh, uh, get the, uh, the 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 data itself uh if we stop it over here what you'll see that is uh, part of one update is uh the fact that ah look this is an activity streams update and so on so this is what what is passing by now on the uh, uh on the on the command line and now with exactly the same ldesk client and without any other uh, uh configuration uh you'll now see that we can do the same for uh, Rijksmuseum museum as it is now also replicating the full uh, catalog of the uh, Rijksmuseum museum over here and i'll also just for the sake of it add a uh, a dash v to this so that you actually see the the data itself the triples itself also pass by on uh, a comment line good this is nice because now we actually proven that uh look DKTP feeds is a generic specification it's actually LDS that's that's being used and you can just use the LDS client to do uh, to do it in uh, uh, any uh, domain to do replication and syn synchronization in uh, in any domain but uh the eldest client as such is not that useful because what you'll get is just uh, uh triples on the on the on the comment line the question is what will we now uh, do with it and um uh, we're proud to 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 already uh lift a tip from the veil in in, in the, the 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 rdf connect uh, framework so there's something new that 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 we started um that enables us to really create pipelines on top of this now so we'll we're able to take the eldest clients pipe it to something else and uh go forward there so what are we building and what did we already build is for example now we can as a harvester also uh, interject a, a shackle validator, for example. And this hints back towards the, one of the things that Matthias said, said earlier, because Matthias earlier said, ah, we need to make sure that I understand why data.europa.eu uh, is, um, uh, is uh, rejecting a certain update from, from my part. Well, well, what if we just take the LDS client, we then pipe it towards the shackle validator that can automatically see, hey, this LDS uh, feed is uh, published using that, that that shackle feed. Do the shackle validation and reject the the, the entities from the moment uh, they come in, but also provides the validation reports as an LDS itself. So now we have a new LDAS over here that just contains the shackle validation uh, reports. And what, for example, is in there, uh, so, so over here at data.europa.eu, you could, it's, it's a prototype, it's, it's not there yet, uh, but it would be really nice that data.europa.eu, for example, would now say, ah, but look, this is our validation feed. Uh, uh, and now we use the timestamp path prof generated that time for that. This validation report was uh, generated uh, today. And uh, uh, what we got here, for example, and this is an actual validation report of the feed that we that we executed uh, on top of the, the the Sweden feed. And over here we found, Matthias, how is that possible? Look at this. There's there's an XSD date that's being used in a byte size. That's impossible, right, Matthias? Yes, it's a copy and paste error in the specification of Sweden, and it was corrected half a year ago or something like that, but it takes time for updates of specifications to, to go through all of the layers and all of the data to actually be updated. So we still have some 
erroneous triples flying around. And I will use this opportunity to write the script and push it uh, to <laughs> some of our sources to make sure it's fixed. Of course, my goal was not to shame anyone. No, but it is good. To the contrary, yeah. because this is yeah, the, because the 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 DKTP fee, the DKTP of of uh, of Sweden is really really well done. Uh, of course, this is just to show that like there is still an error in it, and we found it uh, uh, thanks to now the the DKTP feeds uh, piping towards uh, shackle validation. Yeah. Good. So, um, uh, uh, next thing that we've done, uh, next to the, 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 the publishing, the, the validation reports is to uh, see whether we can now build a pivot conscious importer for data.europa.eu. So data.europa.eu, they, 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 they showed that they have all these different importers. Um, well, what better, uh, to, if, when you create a standard to just create yet another, uh, 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 importer there is exactly what we've done but of course with the with the idea this might replace all the other uh, importers and just create the one uh, generic uh, importer uh, as well so um so uh, there were there were some guidelines uh, from from uh, the, the the pivot team over there to how uh, how they can just uh, uh, create a microservice that can now also um, uh, emit the things in their uh, system so we we are um, uh, so, so this is uh, this is happening at this moment. They can set this up in the system, and uh, uh, now also sync uh, Sweden um, thanks to that uh, to that importer. For uh, the full demo of this, you will have to actually uh, attend the the, the Semic conference because we intend to to, to show an updated uh, version uh, then. And exactly the same RDF Connect uh, uh, idea, but then for the Rijksmuseum Museum data can be created by saying, ah, uh, we also heard uh, uh, Tim present that, ah, but we have more than 20 uh, of these uh, aggregation use cases. One of them is the Against Opacity Hub, which is being developed today. LS could be could be interjected there as uh, doing it uh, uh, properly over there. So uh, in the Against Opacity Hub over there, uh, what we Okay, and my browser crashed again. Yes, uh, Peter, we only missed uh, your last uh, segment on against opacity. Yes, so uh, so for the against opacity uh, uh, hub, it's uh, uh, the the idea is is the same. Uh, like like uh, let's create an aggregator, but also let's filter specifically on specific properties that indicate that that specific. Uh, uh, update is uh, of of interest to us. The live demo in June. Uh, join us for the the online conference uh, uh, there. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, so now it's your turn. Uh, I'll give the, but to introduce your turn, I'll give the word to Natasha. Okay. Um, we hope that all the presentations so far were inspiring for you and you'll get the chance to uh, have a more thorough look at Eldes and um, see ways to adopt it and uh, make it part of your uh, workflow. Uh, so are there any questions uh, now that we have here, Peter and Simon and Tim and Matthias and Matthias. Uh, so uh, would you like to ask a few questions or initiate a discussion? Or we can also have a look at, the, at what was discussed in the chat and elaborate more. So, any raised hands? I, I have a question to Simon from data.europe.eu. 
um, regarding the harvesting mechanism of packages containing data set containing distributions containing access um, data services uh, and now LDAS does a little bit different the contact points publisher has been all as I understood it a bit part of the same one update of one data set and now when they are all distinct so an individual contact point can be updated without you know which data sets referring to it uh, yeah, indep the independence of updates, basically, uh, the, the standalone entities thing. Is that something that is just going to work well with what you already have? Or is it going to be a challenge? Uh, to be honest, we don't know it yet. We're still testing. Um, but as soon as we know, we'll certainly let you know. Great. Uh, do we, are there any other questions for our speakers? If, if not, I would like to ask if we have in our audience, and I know that we have uh, people that are already using LDIST, so maybe they would like to uh, to share a word or uh, say a few things about their experience and ask uh, questions. So um, maybe Sander, do you like to say a couple of words? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we've we've now we have um, we maintain our uh, Alda server and client. I mean, it's part of the the VSDS project, so we're. We're, what we're aiming at is to build a semantic data space. Uh, so in Flanders, we we really believe that um, for this exchange, especially for base registers, and you know, uh, that that having um, linked data as a foundation layer uh, for data spaces is important, and and therefore we we started maintaining um, an Elda server and. A client, uh, as well as uh, well, a set of components, uh, transformer components, to be part of an ETL pipeline to um, to get data into an LDAS uh, server, um, and then at the the client side to, if you need to do some post processing, like uh, you consume an LDAS stream, but only one certain parts, or I mean, to for for these kind of scenarios, um, we. We built this little ecosystem around it, um, and yeah, so those things are there. <laughs> um, I well, so there is a an open source implementation. If you're looking for something usable today, um, and um, I don't know, I think that's our status at the moment. We're uh, the, the the server and client are sort of feature complete from the eldest perspective, but we're right now we're we're uh, sort of wrapping them up in the sense that that we're working on on improving performance and um, yeah, but uh, but it's it's kind of there and to be used. Thank you, Sander. So for anyone um, interested. Uh... He, uh, Asander has already provided the link in the chat, so please follow the link and have a look. And um, as I see in the chat, we also have a question for Bert. Uh, it's targeted uh, to Swindon, Rex Museum, and uh, Open Data Portal. And the question is, what is your experience with implementation effort? So, would you like to... Ah, I see that Matthias already. Yes, I can but, say yes. it aloud as well. <laughs> um, I think we had, as I mentioned in my slides, we already had solutions to some of the issues of harvesting, and it's very, been very um, productive to think of them from another perspective and mature a bit the platform and also reuse and abstract. We, um, it's also been very good to have Peter quickly um, prototyping using the existing uh, tool sets 
I'm not sure we will be able to reuse the tool set directly in our platform. Uh, it's also something we're going to look into uh, since we already have these other aspects of loading files or the, the file based mechanism. So they have to be run in parallel quite close. So yeah, I think it's going well. It's only the deletes that is a bit uh, irritating that we need to figure out a good way of whether we are going to do kind of a, this wrapper mechanism or add it to the source system or keep some more clever step in between. Yeah. I don't know. And probably uh, we're also going to, um, to to potentially add it to the LDAS specification that you can say like, look, we don't keep uh, uh, removals. So if you want to process removals, you'll actually have to each time check the feed whether something disappeared. And if it did disappear, then you actually need to process the removal, something like that, which of course will be very bad for performance, but some systems, uh, it will allow some systems to still comply to to LDAS in a, in a, in a specific way. But that's a, that's a feature that is, it is supported, for example, by IIIF change discovery. So that's why we are thinking about also explicitly allowing it in, in LDAS because uh, because these systems have it, uh, or the, the IIIF change discovery spec has it. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, that kind of retention policy is to be discussed uh, during the, the the LDAS standardization that will happen again starting uh, starting September. Yes, and from from my perspective, I think that has two benefits. One benefit is that, of course, it's going to be easier for developers in some cases to get started with LDAS. Um, the other one is that it might be a more efficient way of um, like a keyframe in a video stream. I know we have talked about that, Peter, but you say we can use fragmentation and keep up from the orig origin all the way up, but still uh, the idea of that error is creeping in over time makes me feel a bit unsure and then i would like to have something uh, similar to like a keyframe at a certain time to go back to this is the state of the catalog at this yeah. point it's a it's a it's a very common uh, thing but uh, but we need to be very clear about the semantics of of what that of how to define that uh, that uh, these kind of things and what what the feature of that of that would be uh, like uh, also checksums have been have been uh, proposed in, in in the past we really need to find a way to standardize it uh, uh, properly so that we have uh, something that can uh, yeah address all these uh, different use cases uh, as well so it's uh, uh, up for discussion uh, uh, in, in, in September to then see how we will extend the spec to also have transactionality, have these kind of, uh, of checksums maybe to, 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 uh, uh, to, to extend it, but, but indeed the, the creative data leads, maybe something like that, that can be put in the LDAS spec itself or uh, as, as a note. So, so all these different things that this is upcoming in the, the, the updated version of the LDAS spec starting, uh, uh, starting September. Yeah, but uh, maybe uh, uh, the question was also towards uh, towards Tim from uh, Rijks Museum. So maybe let's uh, let uh, Tim talk. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think we've uh, we've worked uh, together intensively on uh, on integrating uh, the LDAS uh, API into our existing uh, system. So you actually know more about that than I do. But looking at how we work together to. Uh, to get it working nicely with our uh, uh, IIIF uh, change discovery API into our current uh, component, our current microservice, um, I think uh, I think that wasn't too. Of course, things like this cost time, but it wasn't too uh, uh, too much. I think uh, I think it went great. Yeah, and then uh, uh, with with data uh, data dot Europa dot EU, uh, there uh, yeah we are basically still building it, uh, so so it's not uh, it's not final yet. So so uh, so you'll need to ask your question to them again, Bert. I think in uh, uh, during the, the the workshop in uh, end of June. Or uh, do you want, still want to add something, uh, 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 Mr. Stoyer? No, no, thanks. Yeah. Good. I have a small reflection. Um, the Harvest report that you showed that you could use uh, LDAS feeds for that um, could be one very detailed 
a way of reporting exactly what is wrong. I think there might be need of just having a daily report which is on the level these many data sets were updated, these many data sets were untouched, these were modified. Uh, no, no, that's, <laughs> yeah, updated, uh, unchanged, deleted and added basically. Um, something like that. Yeah, good point. So uh, I think we need another Semic pilot to, uh, to, to, to work on that. Yeah, and that can be made so complex. So the question is, where do you draw the line? Like, do you want to have some kind of mandatory fields missing, recommended fields missing, data type? Yeah. So where, where, how, how detailed should it be? Uh, and also, then the it's fact more that specific. It's... Not then it's not LDAS anymore. Then it's something else. I fear. Well, I, I actually was was going to make the opposite remark. I think uh, okay. it's going to maybe take some extra time to make it uh, use case agnostic, because then if, if it's just harvesting, because harvesting also for Europeana, for example, could be very useful for Rex Museum to understand why a certain uh, piece of artwork was not copied into into uh, uh, into Europeana as well, and uh, what their status is at this moment of copying their latest uh, uh, stuff stuff into it. So also there, the, the the aggregation lock could be could be or the harvesting lock could could be could be very uh, interesting. So maybe we should we should have it as a as a status lock thing that we can define uh, as part of the LDS client. And I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we need to do something there, and uh, and I'm not entirely sure how it's going to look like yeah hmm. but sometimes yeah yeah we also need to take the human psychology into uh, into consideration here and not just errors but also this message is all is well all is well we processed it processed all your data today as well and it went well yeah positive affirmations yes yes yeah. Uh, do you have do we have any other questions from the audience? I see in the chat that uh, there was a, a question from the other Matthias that we have in the audience, Matthias Grunwald, uh, about um, uh, a, a comment on Eldes versus resourcing. And I think that, uh, Peter, you replied, but do you want to elaborate uh, a bit more since we have now some time before we wrap up? Um, uh -huh. uh, yes, but it's, it's, um, there are a couple of sometimes domain specific uh, specifications sometimes general specifications uh, uh, that uh, that already do the same thing replication and synchronization that 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 allow for that it's really 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 difficult to compare uh, them uh, uh, honestly without just having a beauty competition of course uh, saying like ah oh, but this is more beautiful than than, than something else um, so we are really working on a detailed uh, analysis uh, of that for example uh, we identified uh, uh, five patterns that that specifications uh, that can can adhere to, that would probably influence the performance, the scalability, the interoperability, the ease of use, uh, uh, as, as well. Um, and uh, uh, we we are then also running running benchmarks and discussing them uh, them uh, qualitatively, because. I think it's unfair to just say, ah, but LDAS is better than resource sync or resources sync is better than, than LDAS. It depends for what use case and on what pattern specifically and what, what aspect of, of resource sync do you find interesting to apply? Because maybe that feature we could then also add towards LDAS and maybe vice versa. Resource sync could also still be updated to add that specific feature and then also become a, a, a better specification. So LDAS as a, as a, as a, as a system in, in, in that sense, we try to make sure that you can implement that you have the, the, the ease of, of, of implementation uh, so, that it, so that it is easy to come to a certain implementation. And if you do it well, that you can also get to a really performant, efficient uh, uh, LDAS. For example, one of the patterns that, that we have uh, that is specifically to LDAS that none of the other uh, things have is, is the search tree uh, description that really allows to 
to do efficient uh, synchronization, uh, uh, for example. This is something that that, that we then can, can uh, compare and say, ah, but on that specific pattern, yes, LDAS will be better than, but of course, a search tree, it could, you could also describe it on top of a resource sync API, and then, then, you, then we are back at the beginning. So it's, uh, it's just a standard that now is being owned, controlled by, by, by SEMIC that will be able to move forward uh, into that direction. And we have, uh, yeah, I mean, we have a standardization trajectory uh, on it. Uh, and we have some enthusiasm about it, a, co a community. So, uh, so we'll try to uh, move uh, for forward with that. Um, I'm also in sync with, or I'm also syncing up, haha, pun intended, with uh, a Professor Herbert van der Sompel. So I'm also trying to, uh, to to make sure that we don't do any contradictory things uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with um, resource sync. And uh, uh, so, so he is the, the original creator of resource sync, so that we are so that we don't tell any uh, conflicting or opposing uh, stories in that sense, and that we uh, uh, that we can tell a complementary story because in the end we both want uh, more interoperable and more efficient uh, replication and synchronization thank you peter uh, is this um, study that you mentioned uh, published do we do maybe you have a link to provide uh, at this moment it's ongoing work so so that okay. uh, so that so these comparisons these benchmarks and so on um i, I these take up more time than i anticipated as as, as is usual um but uh, uh yeah but but we are really also trying to make no mistakes and and, and certainly if we say something that it, that we are 100 percent sure about what we say because of course if you start talking about other people's work like resource sync or like triple if change discovery as well or like uh, activity pub or like uh, uh the way that open suite map uh, publishes uh, their, their, their changes uh, if we if we are talking about that we, and we say something bad about it, you better be two hundred percent sure. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, other, otherwise, uh, yeah, you're you're going to get into trouble. So um, so so we are being very cautious there with 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 that. The only thing that I can say, like we have a good community, we have a good uh, uh, thing going on now with with Eldas. We will try to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible, so that we maybe in time can also work together with Activity Pub, that we can work together with Triple IF Change Discovery. I'm actually going to their conference i also know the creator of trip life change discovery so trying to, to 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 be good friends with them so so that we can actually join our efforts there uh and to just make uh, a very good uh, uh yeah uh, consensus in the linked data world in general on replication and, and synchronization yeah thank you thank you okay so i i propose that the, if we don't have any other comments or questions we can proceed and i think uh, matthias still has his hand raised uh, ah sorry I, yeah, I think a I very said, sorry, brief matthias. comment uh, yes the question peter uh, have you now from this story about how you're comparing things are you also looking into providing some kind of wrapper functionality between protocols um we um Hmm, that's that's a uh, a difficult question. So so in in the tree um, in the tree specification, we do have uh, a section on compatibilities. So there is an entire uh, compatibility uh, section in which you could also have tree relations on top of uh, uh, an activity pub uh, or activity streams orders collection, for example, which is then also what's being used by Triple IF Change Discovery and so on. So we could make sure that an LS client can in time also uh, consume a triple IF change discovery uh, a feed as is. Um, however, we, 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 during the pilot, this was actually something that we discussed, like, hey, let's not change anything on the, on the server infrastructure of, of Rex Museum. Let's just make sure that we extend the spec of LDAS so that also the compatibility is uh, taken into account, that it also can uh, can take into account the trip life change discovery uh, and yeah just uh, see the, the the eldest configuration as implicit because you use the trip life change discovery however rex museum was not really interested in that they just said ah no well trip life change discovery the scope is limited it's typical it's, it's really cultural heritage there's uh, uh, there's also uh, like it's a discovery thing so then you actually also still need to have another channel to 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 to, to publish the, the, the entities we'll just make sure that we also have an LDAS next to it. It's not that much effort on our side to also have a proper LDAS next to it and to really stick in, in, in your domain. So there's still yeah, different voices uh, going towards either 
providing more compatibilities to also different specs, either to, to say like, ah, oh, but these specs can also just evolve towards, uh, towards making sure that they uh, describe themselves using, uh, uh, using LDAS uh, additions. Thank you. So, can we move to our next slide, please? Yes. So, uh, anyway, if there are more questions or, co or comments, you can reach out to us. You can contact us via email and we will be happy to respond and see how we can support. Uh, so, now let's um, see what are the next steps, what we foresee for ELTES. So, as it was hinted multiple times during this webinar by Peter, we are having a, an elders uh, workshop during um, uh, the previous day from the SEMIC 2024 conference. So, the SEMIC 2024 um, is on the 27th of June and on the 26th we are having an elders workshop uh, titled from um, from pilots to, uh, to the specification. So what's going to be there? We are going to give you an update of the pilots that you saw today, but also what happened with the pilots that were running from the past up to now. You're gonna have an update and see what is the future of elders. Um, Unfortunately, the session, the workshop, is uh, fully booked for uh, physical participation, but uh, for those of you who didn't have time to register, you can uh, follow us uh, virtually, so please um, uh, connect and uh, follow online the workshop. Um, so next, in, on to, in September, October, the, um, we're going to start uh, with the, the LD standardization track. So, uh, we are having Digital Flanders assisting us in this since they are a champion of elders and uh, they are organizing now a preparatory track, meaning that since they have been working with elders for a very long time, they are collecting issues and they are prioritizing them. So, we will start uh, smoothly the standardization track from September on. And uh, we would like to have a working group in the community around elders. So please have a look at um, GitHub and uh, post issues, join our uh, working group and follow us for more. So this is it from uh, our side. We, uh, we were happy that you participated in this webinar and we hope to see you on Zoom. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to all the speakers that contributed to this webinar.